timely reminder. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, AEI. My name is Jeff Eisenach. I'm a visiting scholar here. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's discussion with uh, the European Union's Commissioner for Competition, Margrethe Vesteyer. Before introducing Commissioner Vesteyer, I'd like to note that we have probably several luminaries in the room today, but in particular, Ambassador of the European Union to the United States, David O'Sullivan is here. I wanted to welcome Ambassador O'Sullivan uh, and thank him for being here. Uh, on a procedural note, uh, our program will begin today with remarks from Commissioner Vestager. After that, she's agreed to take some questions. I'll ask the first few, uh, and then we will open it up to the audience. When we do, we'll ask that you wait for the microphone and that you state your name and your affiliation uh, before uh, asking your question. Now, it's a great honor for us to have Commissioner Vestager with us today. Uh, she's a native of Denmark and has served in very senior positions in the, in the Danish government, including as Minister of Education from 1998 through 2001, Minister for Economic Affairs in the Interior from 2011 to 2014. She was political leader of the Danish Social Liberal Party, and Ambassador <clears throat> uh, O'Sullivan and I were talking about those words have somewhat different meanings. <laughs> <laughs> in Denmark maybe than they do here. Um, but uh, she was political leader of the Danish Social Liberal Party from 2007 to 2014. Uh, and it's my understanding that she has served as the role model for the protagonist of a popular Danish television series about the election of the country's first female prime minister. So she's not prime minister, but someone plays one based on her on television. So. Um, in Brussels, she served as president of the Economic and Financial Council, also known as ECOFIN, in 2012. And in October 14, 2014, she was confirmed by the European Parliament as Commissioner for Competition. Since then, she has been responsible for some of the largest and most significant antitrust actions in the history of the European Union. While not all of these, and indeed the majority, have not involved U.S. companies, Certainly the ones that have gotten the most attention on this side of the Atlantic have, including the abuse of dominance finding against Google earlier this year, resulting in a fine, the largest antitrust fine in European Union history of $2.7 billion, and her 2016 finding that Ireland's tax treatment of Apple has violated the EU's prohibitions against state aid, meaning that Apple owes currently uh, $14 billion in back taxes. Now, actions like these have won praise from some and criticism from others. Here at AEI, we are committed to free enterprise and competitive markets, including competition in the marketplace of ideas. And with that in mind, it's an honor to welcome Commissioner Vestager to the American Enterprise Institute. We look forward to your remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and I, I knew I'd feel welcome, and it's not only because of, uh, of the very sort of Danish way my name was pronounced, <laughs> which is actually quite rare, I can tell you this, um, but also uh, that this institute uh, has a motto. Uh, the competition of ideas is fundamental to a free society. Uh, and for me, this is what policymaking is all about. Uh, if our ideas are never challenged, they'll never get any better. Uh, we end up stuck with ideas that once served us well, but uh, haven't kept up with changes in our world and our societies. And when we don't hear different views, well, I think also we lose the freedom to think for ourselves. And just as competition of ideas is uh, fundamental to a free society, competition in our markets is fundamental to a fair one. 
because challenges and competition makes us better. If businesses aren't challenged, if they don't have to compete, well, they don't have any reason to work better, to serve people better. Competition is that motor that actually drives businesses to do better for consumers, to cut prices, to offer more choice, to produce innovative products. Competition enforcers didn't build that motor. We just help to keep it running, running smoothly by getting rid of the obstacles that may stop competition from doing its work. And this is why antitrust rules prevent uh, cartels, stop dominant companies misusing their powers to drive out competitors. This is why we have rules to make sure that mergers do not undermine competition. And this is also why now more than 60 years ago, when the European Union was founded, we were given rules on state aid to stop governments using subsidies to give some companies an unfair benefit and therefore unravel the level playing field. The most basic aim of competition rules is that of keeping prices down. In the past five years, more than half of antitrust decisions has been about putting a stop to cartels. Like our de decision last year to fine five European truck makers a total of nearly 3 billion euros for a cartel that fixed gross list prices of trucks for 14 years. Most of our work on mergers is also about keeping prices down. In more than 90% of the mergers that we have to step into, the last year and the year before, our main concern were that the merger would have meant fewer competitors and higher prices. And that makes a real difference. Uh, in those two years, our estimate is that the work on mergers and cartels have saved customers as much as 30 billion euros. And that is without ever considering the mergers that were never filed or the cartels that were never formed because our rules wouldn't have allowed for it. But there is more to competition than keeping prices down. Even when a product seems to be free, like a search engine or a social network, competition still helps to get consumers a better deal. Last year, we looked at Microsoft's merger with LinkedIn. And even though most people use LinkedIn without paying for it, at least in cash, we were concerned that the merger would affect competition we knew that the merger, uh, after the merger, the two companies would uh, connect their products. Uh, and that would have risked shutting down uh, other professional uh, social networks of the European market. Without competition, users would have lost choice. They could have lost, for example, the chance to choose another service or a service with the best privacy policy. So we only approved the merger after Microsoft gave us commitment that it will keep the market open also after the merger. Competition gives us more choice and lower prices today. But it also helps us to get better products tomorrow. Because competition, the drive to get ahead of your competitors, that pushes businesses to keep innovating. Earlier this year, we found that the merger between Dove and DuPont would 
not just raise prices, but also hold back innovation. Dove and DuPont were two of just five um, uh, companies that took part in all stages of developing pesticides to meet the needs of farmers throughout the world. And we found evidence that they plan to cut back on their research uh, after the merger. That would have slowed innovation. It would have left farmers stuck with older products that may have been less effective and more toxic. So we only approved the merger after companies agreed to sell uh, a large part of DuPont's pesticides business, including the worldwide uh, research arm for pesticides. Innovation was also an issue uh, in our decision against Google earlier this year. Consumers don't pay to use Google's search engine, not in cash at least. But that doesn't change the fact that search of the internet is a market. And it is one in which Google is dominant in Europe, with more than 90% market share in most European countries. Market dominance gives a special responsibility, a special responsibility under European competition law. And this is a responsibility not to abuse the power, but to keep competition only on the merits of products and services. And in our decision, we uh, established that Google did not comply with this obligation. Instead, Google decided to use its power as a search engine to deny other companies a chance to compete on neighboring markets, namely the market for shopping comparison. Google showed its own comparison shopping service at the very top of the first page of search results. And that gave its own services a prominence that its competitors couldn't match. And Google also demoted its rival services in search results so that they only appeared on average on page four. And just go through your recent behavior when you have done a search on the internet. How often did you get to page four? I see no raised hands. <laughs> The results were effectful, impressive. Google's rivals suddenly lost as much as 90% of their traffic. And despite their best efforts, they never got all these visitors back. And that matters. Not because we feel sorry for uh, those competitors. After all, for competition to do its job, well, Companies have to be able to lose as well as win. But that cut both ways. Big companies also have to face competition, to face the risk of failure. And that won't happen if we allow them to use their power to stop anyone else from having the chance to compete. Because when companies can't lose, they cannot do better either. Of course, and this is obvious, I'm sorry to waste your time saying this, it is not the job of a competition authority to take the place of the market, to set the prices of truck, to tell Google or Dove uh, that innovation is important and what it can produce. But we know that as long as competition stay fierce, those companies will have no choice but to meet consumers' needs, to keep prices low, to make an effort to innovate. And 
there is no need for us to interfere in that process by trying to say precisely what should be the outcome of competition. But there are times when public authorities, as such, need to go further. When it does make sense to control what the market produces. When our health, or our environment, or our basic rights are in question. These are important concerns. But they are not something that competition rules can fix. Not because there is a problem with our competition rules, but because competition is only part of the answer. Look at pesticides, for example. Farmers, they need affordable, innovative pesticides. And competitive markets can answer that. So by protecting competition, our decisions on the merger between Dove and Dupont will keep prices down and innovation thriving. And we will take the same approach when we look at the merger, the planned merger between Bayer and Monsanto. But prices or innovation are not the only things that matter. I've had many letters, postcards, emails, tweets, from people who are concerned about these chemical mergers. Sometimes they worry about prices and innovation, but ever so often they are worried about what pesticides can do to the environment, or to our health, or the safety of our food. And I agree that we cannot just rely on the market to guarantee that pesticides are safe for the farmers, for environment, for us as consumers. We need the protection of clear and strict regulation. Europe has some of the world's uh, most stringent pesticide regulations in the world. Those regulations applied before the mergers, and they will still apply after the mergers, no matter what form they may be completed in. Both to the companies that merge and to companies that do not merge. But we shouldn't mix things up. My job as a European Commissioner for Competition is to look at how a merger will affect exactly competition. And that is what I will do with my teams. Controlling vehicle uh, emissions is another case where competition law enforcement is not enough. Understandably, many people are concerned about how their lifestyle uh, affects uh, the environment. And through the market, they can put a lot of pressure on companies to innovate and to produce greener products. And if companies uh, sort of answers or respond to that pressure by working together to resist the demand for greener products, then competition enforcers may have to step in. And that's what happened in this truck makers cartel I just told you about. Because the other side of it was not only the coordination of grassless prices, it was also that its members coordinated the introduction of greener technology so that none of them would bring the new technology to the market before they were forced to do that. But we cannot just rely on the markets to protect the environment. We still need rules for vehicle uh, emissions that protect our health and our climate. And we need regulators who can punish companies that break those rules. But it is for them. Competition enforcement is a bit of a paradox. Our job is to help markets work better and more freely. But to do that, we need to interfere in the markets. 
And that is, of course, a paradox. And it, it makes the work a delicate balance. We shouldn't step in when competition is not really threatened. We should block a merger, for example, that would cut costs for consumers. But it is just as important that we do not look away when we see something happening that does harm competition. Either way, if we get it wrong, consumers will suffer. So, what can we do? And this will be the end. Because I would like, of course, to make a bow, because I think the good thing to do is to look at the motto of this institute. By making sure that also our ideas of competition are open to competition. We can exchange ideas with experts, both in Europe and further away. And in fact, we do just that all the time. We do it through organizations like the International Competition Network, which bring together more than 100 authorities from all over the world, including the Federal Trade Commission and Department of Justice. And that network helps us to discuss some of the trickiest issues of, uh, of competition enforcement. And it helps us to reach common ground, as we did in 2014, as an example, when we agreed uh, on recommended practices on predatory pricing. We also exchange ideas about cases. Uh, since the start last year, we worked with US authorities on more than 20 different mergers, like the mer merger between AB uh, InBrew and SAB Miller, the, two, the world's two largest uh, beer brewers, or the ChemChina takeover of Syngenta. We've discussed things like um, how these mergers might harm consumers and what could be done better to restore competition. And that cooperation and those discussions has helped us to protect consumers better. Being open to new ideas is maybe more important now than ever, because our markets are going through enormous changes. Some of those changes are about technology. Algorithms are taking over decisions from people, including decisions on the prices that companies charge. Big data, it's uh, also a big helper to cut costs and improve services, which could, uh, could mean that companies without that data uh, struggle to compete. Meanwhile, some markets uh, are showing signs of becoming more concentrated with fewer, bigger companies. Even if, so far, Europe's, in Europe, those signs are limited to a few uh, industries in certain countries. So we need to discuss these issues now, when we can still adapt. And that is why I'm looking to set up uh, a panel of experts from outside the Commission to advise us uh, on how these changes will affect consumers and how competition enforcement should respond. Because even though our world is changing, I think it is clear that competition rules still matter. For many, many years to come, competitive markets will still be the best way to meet consumers' needs. Low prices, wide choice, uh, innovative products for tomorrow. And to make sure that markets work, we need competition rules to be enforced. Applying those rules in practice won't get any easier. But we don't have a choice. Competition in the market is as fundamental to a fair society as competition of, I of ideas is to a free one. And I think that is as true today as it has ever been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
Well, you've covered a lot of ground, um, and I want to spend a couple of minutes just drilling down on some of these uh, current antitrust issues. Um, and let, let me start with a, with a quote, uh, kind of fam very famous in American antitrust jurisprudence from, uh, I think, the judge with the best name of all time, Learned Hand, um, somehow never made it onto the Supreme Court. Uh, but Judge Hand, a very famous appeals court judge, uh, wrote that it was very important that the antitrust not punish the successful competitor, mm. the firm which, by virtue of its expertise, its hard work, its entrepreneurship, uh, is successful in uh, capturing the market. Uh, and, and as Judge Hand said, the successful competitor, having been urged to compete, must not be turned upon when he wins. Uh, so, as, as you think about the problem, this is an, that's an old quote and this is an old problem, that's a quote from 1945. Um, as you think about that and you think about the Googles of the world and the Facebooks of the world who are unquestionably have won the race, um, what are the, how do you distinguish between conduct which is harmful to consumers and harmful to competition as opposed to conduct which is simply harming the unsuccessful, the less, um, the firm's producing less value, uh, who haven't been as entrepreneurial or successful in, 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 in the race. Well, this is exactly the balance. Yes. Uh, to make sure that you get the right distinctions. Uh, in Europe, we have, no, uh, we have no ban on monopolies. You're more than welcome to grow one yourself. You can't buy one, but you can grow one. <laughs> if, uh, if you have uh, products that people like, and they keep coming, then you can keep growing. Uh, the only thing is that uh, when you then, because of your virtues of your products, become dominant, then you get a special responsibility because it is quite obvious that competition suffers if you yourself hold like 90% of the market. So you get this responsibility not to misuse uh, your muscle. Um, and, and this is exactly the thing. Uh, you can grow, you can grow big, we will congratulate you all the way, but congratulations stops if we find that you start misusing your position. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, what we will have to be tested on in, in court, uh, because this is exactly the case of the Google case. Well, so also the Intel case. So last week, um, uh, in 2009, uh, the commission found Intel uh, uh, in violation of the abuse of dominance uh, rules uh, by virtue of giving rebates uh, to um, some of its customers in a way that was alleged to drive out competition. Mm -hmm. And last week, uh, the European Court of Justice remanded that decision. It's been through the courts now in a couple of rounds of appeal, remanded the, d the decision back to a lower court. And as I, I read, fully read the decision, but as I understand it, uh, on the grounds that neither the commission nor the courts the lower courts had given sufficient account to the question of whether Intel's, Intel's conduct would harm an equally efficient competitor. So that's a, that's a standard which is um, uh, very much part of American jurisprudence. Um, do you see that decision having an effect on, first of all, how do you see that decision as it affects the Intel matter to the extent you can talk about it? And, and then do you see that decision affecting other matters underway, Google, Qualcomm, and so forth? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to have an opinion on something that is undecided. Right. Because basically, uh, uh, the, the European Court of Justice said to the General Court, you have to redo your work. Yeah. You have to look into the substance once again, and the rest of us will have to, uh, of course, respectfully wait and see what comes out of this. Uh, in the meantime, obviously, we have work to do. And uh, we have also, of course, developed uh, working methods and line of thinking since the Intel decision back in 2009. Uh, so we will keep working our cases. Uh, and I think it is important also to recognize that most cases, they will be looked at from both sides, both from the side of what's the effect and what's the object of, uh, of the behavior. Uh, the two other aspects of, uh, of the case, the one of jurisdiction, uh, was a very clear win for the Commission. Uh, and uh, the third one will sort of keep us uh, in sort of thinking mode uh, for some time uh, because it was a question of how um, uh, a meeting with a witness was being recorded. Uh, it had no influence on the concrete case. 
We have changed procedures since then, but the court still gave, gave us guidance as how to do this looking forward, and that, of course, we will respect and, and try to follow that guidance. Okay. Um, the, uh, so uh, I'm sure there are real limits on what you want to say or, or can say, uh, but just with respect to Google, because obviously there's a lot of interest, um, I think we have not had the full written decision released yet, is that unless mm -hmm. it's been very recent? So when do you, when, when will we see, because there are a lot of people looking forward to reading it. Um, and, and then um, just for people who are not following this as closely, maybe can you talk a little bit about the concerns with Android and AdSense and what those investigations entail? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really do our best to try to make our decisions public as fast as possible. Uh, but that, of course, had to respect uh, that there can be concerns of business confidi sure. confidentiality. So we have to clear the decisions first. And that takes the time it takes. Uh, but that we make a priority after the decision has been taken, because as you say, a lot of people would like to read uh, the decisions in full, as full as they can be when, when we have uh, deducted some of the most, uh, most confidentiality confidentiality concerned issues. You have a very difficult language, you realize that? <laughs> I have a number of words, I try to avoid them, but then, well, anyway. Um, the two other cases are very different. Uh, the AdSense case is a case about uh, placement of ads on third party uh, sites. Uh, what can you make out of, of demands as how this can be worked? Uh, for, for people also to enter this market of placing ads on third-party websites. Um, the Android uh, case may be more interesting because it has to do with uh, dominance and, and search when we all go mobile. Because this is, of course, the only thing that is growing and growing very, very fast. We all become mobile, we have our smartphones, tablets, smaller screens. And uh, in the statement of objection, what we're saying is that, uh, as we see it, uh, Google has been using Android, which is a very interesting uh, operating system. It's open source. Uh, a lot of amazing things can be said about that. But that it has been used to make sure that when you're open uh, your box, then you have the Google experience uh, on your smartphone. And now, of course, we're in the process of going through uh, the Google uh, defense on, on the statement of objection. And uh, eventually, we will come to a decision. OK. Um, one, one distinction, or at least I think a lot of Americans perceive a distinction uh, between US enforcement and uh, in the EU, and I think this applies both to mergers and, and maybe especially abuse of dominance, is the role of competitors. Um, so um, it's certainly the case that competitors will show up with complaints before the Federal Trade Commission mm -hmm. or the Department of Justice. But I guess at least the perception is that they receive a friendlier hearing uh, when they res show up in front of DG Comp in, in, uh, in Brussels. Um, do you share that perception? Do you think that uh, European antitrust jurisprudence uh, is less skeptical or gives more weight to competitor complaints than in the United States? And if so, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I don't think our courts have this bias. And since they don't have the bias, we don't have the bias. Uh, because uh, our decisions, they go to court, uh, almost with no exception. Few, but almost with no exception. So, uh, so we have to prepare to be heard in court. And what our courts want is, of course, the jurisprudence, is the evidence, the fact of the case. They don't want to hear any sort of soft feelings that, oh, we feel sorry for you. It has no place in a courtroom. So yes, of course, it's a source of uh, uh, information, uh, of concern to get a case started, but it's not the case of the competitor. It is what happens to the consumer if this behavior uh, can actually be proven uh, with the evidence of the case. Um, and, and this is what we do, and I don't think there is any problem in listening to complainants, taking uh, on board the evidence they come with, it's our responsibility to make sure that we get the evidence right. Okay. Well, you mentioned consumer welfare. This is uh, mm -hmm. my last question, or, or next to last. Um, so, um, you know, we live in obviously very challenging times. Mm -hmm. um, times of tremendous change, uh, political change, uh, both in the U.S. and the EU. Brexit and uh, the EU. The Trump election obviously is signs of 
turmoil in the United States, and and um, and, and those the the sense that um, big business or high tech has not produced the kind of benefits that people would have liked to have seen, or at least they haven't been shared fairly across society, uh, has led to calls on both sides of the Atlantic uh, for competition to play a more active role in remediating um, those problems. Um, you know, you um, said in talking about the Apple decision, I think, that part of the motivation there was that Europeans uh, were angry, I think was the word you used, about uh, what's happened and about the role played by kind of big high-tech companies earning billions in profits and, and not paying taxes. Um, in the U.S., we've had this phenomenon of what some people have referred to as, as hipster antitrust, the notion that antitrust ought to expand, and some of our, we call them progressives here, senators, um, have uh, you know come up with the notion that antitrust ought to play a much broader role in kind of pursuing social justice. So I, I read some of the things you'd written previously, and you spoke to this mm -hmm. issue from the podium here. Ta in that, so and apologize for the broad question, uh, but but in that kind of broad context, you know, how how do you see the limits of antitrust? How, how far can antitrust go to helping to pursue these kind of social ju justice objectives? And what are the hard limits where it just needs to step back and say that's not our, not our, not ours to solve. Well, for us, we are obliged by, by our laws, by our treaty, and and those political choices we're taking a, a long, long time ago, uh, sixty <laughs> years ago, and and this is our mandate, and I think it is very, very important to stick to that mandate, uh, because even though a lot of competence is with the European Commission. It's, it's, a very, it's a very powerful tool. Um, I think anyone who has been uh, doing a little um, do-it-yourself know that just because you have a wonderful hammer, not everything is a nail. Um, I know firsthand from you wouldn't want to see my walls. Uh, <laughs> so you definitely have to know the limitations of antitrust uh, because there are uh, democratically elected institutions who have their responsibility. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's a good thing because otherwise you completely delegitimize what we do in our analytical work in, in murders, in a castle investigation, uh, looking into a case of misuse of dominant position, if we start to, to pour other things down uh, that part. Um, and that I think is important. Uh, and the other thing is that we also try to, to be precise to say, well, when we take a decision, it's about a certain behavior a certain behavior that may be illegal. Uh, because most companies also have produced wonderful things. Uh, I can remember what it was like to try to find something on the internet before we had search engines. You, you'd hardly try, because you had to get the full address completely right, otherwise just forget about it. Uh, the innovation produced by some of the companies, well, they have changed our societies. They have changed our lives. Uh, these are amazing innovations. Uh, and this is, this is why they are successful. If, if, I think if you were ask any European, why, why do you Google things? Why do you have a Facebook account? They'd say, it works. It's wonderful. I like it. They would never come up with the answer that it's because it's an American company. <laughs> Maybe the opposite, even. <laughs> well, thank you for all of uh, those great answers. And now uh, we do have an opportunity for the audience. I think the first hand I saw uh, was right here. Wait for a microphone. It's on its way. And um, introduce yourself, please. Um, hello, Commissioner. My name is Don Baker. I'm a former. Uh, spent 10 years in antitrust enforcement at the Justice Department. And I wanted to ask you about these fines. In other words, we in this country tend to look at big fines as something that we impose on conduct that's unmitigate, you know, there's no justification for it. It's per se illegal, uh, and we limit it pretty much to cartel kind of activity. In Europe, you're levying record fines against conduct that in in a way, falls more within a rule of reason, namely uh, priorities and things like this. And by contrast, in this country, 
we, we get injunctive relief, maybe structural relief against monopolies, but we don't, we don't hammer them with, with big fines. And I just wondered whether you have any reaction to that kind of issue and concern. Well, I, I had n never uh, sort of had the line of thinking that we are hammering big companies. We are punishing illegal behavior because you can be, you can be big in Europe, very, very, very big. You can grow enormous market shares if consumers like your products. Um, and the level of fines uh, recently is more a reflection of the size of the companies. Uh, because we have a set of guidelines uh, to say what to take into consideration, uh, turnover, duration, um, sort of the, the depth uh, of the illegal behavior. Uh, and that, of course, we follow uh, in order for people to, to know what they would get themselves into uh, if they catalyzed a, a product or, or misused the dominant position. So, so obviously, this, this is important for us. Uh, I don't know the, the, the differences uh, in any detail uh, between the two jurisdictions, but what I can see is that even with the, the differences, it still allows us uh, to work very closely together. What is different is treated differently, but where things are the same, I, I also do hope that companies find that they get more or less the same treatment. I wasn't suggesting that. Was no, no. Name. Yes. Can, can I follow up on that? Because it raises, um, that, that's a fabulous question, Don. And, and the, but the, so we have a way of imposing big fines on big corporations that violate Section 2. Um, we do it through private litigation. So I'm reminded that I think, the, I maybe have this wrong, but I think Sun won $4 billion in the Microsoft case um, as a result of private litigation, follow-on litigation, mm -hmm. um, after the government's prosecution. Um, so in that context, what is the state of private antitrust litigation in the European Union and uh, thinking in the context of the Google matter, for example, presumably some of the competitors who have been harmed by Google as found by the Commission, um, presumably some of them would be pursuing litigation. Is, where, where does that stand? Because it's never been as big a factor in the EU as it has been in the US. Oh. No, it, uh, it hasn't, and it's only very recently that our legislation has come into effect for private damages. And uh, now the last member states are just in the process of making it also national uh, legislation. Um, we're seeing sort of the first uh, uh, private damages sort of coming up, but it's, it's way too early to have any kind of prognosis as to how will this uh, define the future. Um, the very basic idea, and it was of course by my, my predecessor, was to say, well, if you also can for, go for, for private damages, the, the deterrent effect uh, will be much bigger. Right. Uh, because we haven't had this before, but we have seen the effects uh, in other jurisdictions. Right. Um, we had another question here. Hi, my name is Matt Miller. I'm with Capital Group, but we run the American Funds family of mutual funds. And I'm curious, the general uh, privacy data regulation, which is taking effect, I believe, in May in Europe, um, do you expect that that will impact the business models of the large tech firms through what I've seen is discussion of different opt-in or consent provisions? and? How might that impact your own work in the competition sphere? Any thoughts on that? Well, as, as you're suggesting, this is not my portfolio. Uh, this is in the hands of my, my colleague, uh, Vera uh, Jourova. Um, but obviously, this, this is for us very important. Uh, a lot of work has gone into to making new privacy rules. Uh, they come into effect May next year. And, and the main benefit is that you get one set of rules for uh, the entire European Union. Uh, there are some uh, things that are new, uh, the right to give, be forgotten, portability of your data, uh, but basically it sort of creates the benefit of having one set of rules. Uh, I think to some degree, um, because my nature is sort of a glass half full uh, nature, uh, it can be very beneficial. 
uh, because if businesses take this on board, maybe also to some degree to offer privacy by design, it can sort of recreate uh, or reconnect with users. Uh, I think the last time uh, Europeans were asked, four out of five said we feel that we are absolutely have no control of our uh, personal data. And, and I think that poses a risk to all the benefits that can come from big data. So if this can be a push to say, well, we will make it more accessible, more understandable, so that you know what, we, what you're doing, uh, and rules are simpler, uh, you don't have to relate to, as a business, to uh, 28 uh, different ways of doing this, uh, then I think it can be beneficial both on the business side of things and on, on the user side of things. Uh, Ms. Gentleman? My name is Ali Breland. I'm a reporter with The Hill newspaper. Um, the question I had was about how uh, White House officials had reportedly discussed uh, making companies like Google and Facebook public utilities. Um, I was curious to get your take on this argument um, and see if you're amenable to it. Thanks. Uh, we have a, a very uh, high bar for that. Um, public utility or essential uh, facility, as we would call it. Uh, the obvious examples would be sewers, uh, railroads, uh, the tracks, uh, that kind of thing, because the test would be that it is uh, not economically doable to do a parallel structure, uh, that it's prohibitive in its nature. And, and so far, we have not found that when it comes to the digital part of our economy. Uh, they still find that, well, some of these uh, structures and some of these networks, uh, it is not the economy that prevents you from doing something similar. So this is, this is why I think this discussion has been slightly different in, in Europe. Let me hit a follow-up on that again. Um, so um, there has been discussion about big data as an essential facility, if I can take those two words and put mm -hmm. them together, and the, and and the with the uh, with the proposal not so much being one of public utility regulation, but rather mandated sharing um, of some sort. Uh, and I think uh, a year or so ago, the commission issued a, uh, I, uh, had a consultation on some of these questions. Mm -hmm. um, where did that? come out and, and what is the current thinking on kind of the need for companies that, whether it's a Google or a Facebook, um, have unique big data data sets or mm. arguably, allegedly unique big data data sets. Um, what is the thinking on whether they should be required under some circumstances to share those with potential competitors? Well, we, we try to, uh, to make things complicated. <laughs> by saying that you cannot discuss big data just as big data, because there are many, many, many different kinds of data. Uh, on the one hand side, you have data that is not to be uh, replicated, that has a very long duration, that effectively can serve as, a, uh, as an asset that can foreclose competitors from entering your market. On the other hand side, you have data which is easily uh, recollected, uh, the duration is very short, uh, it's very open for competitors to get the same or more data. And then of course you have all complex situations in between. Um, we've had a, a few cases, uh, not with us, uh, but for instance the French National Competition Authority, they ordered uh, I think what was their old electricity uh, incumbent, mm. who used to have a monopoly, to share some of their customer data uh, with competitors <laughs> in order to do sort of uh, add-on sales for those customers who were buying electricity um, because you couldn't get this data any other way. But, uh, but that being said, I think it is, it is very important to, to keep this co conversation complicated because otherwise we sort of just close down, uh, I think, a lot of the opportunities uh, in data when it comes to health, transportation, uh, environment, uh, preventing all kinds of things that we don't want in our societies. Um, but obviously we also prepare ourselves, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Microsoft LinkedIn 
uh, case to look into these questions uh, also in some detail to see if the question of data and the form it, it takes uh, will be a computation problem. Okay. Um, so many hands. Why don't we stay in this row? This is going to be the lucky row today. Lydia Bayoud, I'm a reporter with the Venture for News. Commissioner, can you give us some more uh, details on the foreign investment screen that the Commission is considering and whether or not you think the U.S.'s uh, CFIUS model is something that could be adopted in Europe? Uh, yes, we have, uh, we have exactly been, been looking into other models uh, because we see that the U.S. has this kind of screening. I think Canada has it as well. We find it in Japan. Uh, some member states already have FDI screening uh, in different forms. And I think since world trade and, and also investment is developing quite fast these years, uh, as I see it, it becomes more qualified, more based on, uh, on, on mutual trust uh, and building up relationships when it comes to different ways of, of regulating issues that takes your interest. Um, but I think it is very important that we have this element of reciprocity. That if, if you can buy things with me, I can buy things with you. Uh, and it is completely legitimate to say, well, we would like to, to have access to consider if this is uh, uh, not against what we could call public order. I know this is a rather broad concept, uh, but anyway. Uh, and for us, it has been important as well, again, not to sort of just pour it in uh, the merger uh, analysis pot, because that would just complicate things there, but to keep it as a se separate instrument uh, now to be discussed uh, with member states. I think the proposal is to be tabled if it hasn't been tabled very, very recently. I think we'll take one last question. We'll go right here in the front row. Lou Gagliano, independent consultant. The question I have is how do you look at uh, in contracts that governments give to uh, corporations and evaluate the question of is that a fair contract or not, given the fact that that government, whether it's Ireland or whether any other member of the Commission, uh, the uh, European group, uh, has its own responsibility to manage its own affairs. So how do you, how do you really not step on their kind of uh, ability to run their own country? What we have been, uh, been looking into, and this has been going on for, for quite some time, uh, a number of the cases were started with my uh, predecessor, and part of the work uh, when it comes to fiscal state aid go all the way back to Mario Monti. Uh, so it's a long-standing tradition and, and our court have said very uh, precisely that we have a responsibility to control state aid no matter the form it takes. Uh, it could be cash, it could be a fiscal benefit, it could be a, a building a lot, it can be a, a loan with a very favorable uh, interest rate. Um, and in the fiscal uh, state aid cases, uh, we've been looking at both schemes, but also tax rulings. Uh, and when we look into the tax rulings, they are by nature selective because this is for just one company and they're not available uh, to anyone else. Um, and then, of course, we see, well, uh, does this give a selective advantage in the way that things are set up? Uh, and this is our test. Is there selective advantages here? Um, the IRIs are perfectly welcome to have a corporate level of taxation of 12.5%, as well as they in Luxembourg are perfectly, uh, um, it's perfectly legal for them to have, I think, 28. So you find varied corporate tax rates, but our test is if it's for you, but not for everyone else. Uh, some of the schemes that we have found has been schemes to say, well, uh, this is for multinationals only, but not for standalone businesses, as a scheme in Belgium. Uh, and on the other hand side, we have found uh, schemes in other countries that were set up uh, to promote uh, national businesses to the disadvantage of multinational businesses. And those, of course, we have dealt with uh, as well and in the same way to say, well, you cannot do that. You have to make sure that the way you, you, 
use your freedom to, to do your own taxation uh, that it's done with a level playing field. We're going to let that be the last comment, level playing field. Level playing field, that's a beautiful word <laughs> to close on. Thank you so much for being here.